Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, buy, and how of newspaper analysis. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper, dated 6th of January 2023. The articles that we are going to cover today have been displayed on the screen. It's time for you to subscribe to our prelims test series and PSIR mains test series. The first article that we have taken has appeared on page number 16. Huge green hydrogen subsidy distorts trade. So India believes huge subsidies announced by some developed countries for their green hydrogen sectors can distort and is in violation of world trade organization norms. And this has been said by Power Minister R.K. Singh, who was speaking at a press conference where he said that big subsidies were a challenge for the industry in India as it aims to emerge as the most cost competitive source of green hydrogen in the world. Now from this particular article, Two important topics for both prelims and mains emerge. First one is World Trade Organization and the second one is Green Hydrogen and Green Ammonia Policy. Now why is it important for civil services examination? Now if you have seen the syllabus of GS paper 2, you must have seen an important line. Important international institutions, agencies and fora their structure mandate. And so in this regard, not just for the prelims examination, obviously this is important for that, but from the perspective of mains examination, there are few things which are very important. And so in this regard, we will start by first understanding why is there a need for such an international organization? Why in the backdrop of World War II, a need was felt for that GATT was created and then finally WTO took it from there. So we'll understand the basics of WTO, its advantages, and then finally we will look into the challenges currently being faced by WTO. Now starting with the basics, because most of our viewers are quite new and for them it is very very important to understand how and why it was created. So before WTO there existed a GATT or General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, it more or less functioned on the same lines, which was created in 1948 to regulate world trade. And it was created as a means to boost economic recovery after Second World War by reducing and eliminating trade tariffs, quotas and subsidies. So during the Great Depression, a breakdown of international relations and an increase in trade regulation made poor economic condition even worse and it contributed to the outbreak of Second World War. And just as the war finished, allies believed that a multilateral framework for the world trade would loosen the protectionist policies that defined 1930s. Now what are the protectionist policies and what are these tariffs and quotas and subsidies? So these are a way to carry out protectionism which is a practice of following protectionist state policy which allows for the government of a country to promote its own domestic producers, service providers and thereby boost their domestic production of goods and services. For example, let's say if there is a government contract and if government of India mandates that only Indian companies can bid for that contract, that is a kind of protectionism. Similarly, let's say that government of India puts a limit on how much cars can be imported, let's say 100 per year, that is a quota. Similarly, Government of India can impose, let's say, 100% import duty on a lot of products and that is tariff. Or in other ways, the Government of India can provide domestic producer of cars 50% rebate in, let's say, iron and steel. And so that is a subsidy. And so all these kinds of measures are called protectionist policies. So the taxes or duties imposed on imports are known as tariffs. Restriction on the volume of import are known as quotas and negative taxes or tax credits are known as subsidies. So these are the three main ways of providing protection. And let us understand them by an image which you can see on your screen. So these are tariffs. Then government provides subsidies which allows producers to lower the price of local goods and services because they are getting benefits from the government. Then you impose quotas. And then, no matter how low a sea sets the price through subsidies, it cannot ship more goods because there is a limit on how much you can import. And even if that good is very cheap, you cannot import more than that. And then finally, you tweak with the currency, deliberate attempt by a country to lower its currency value, which would make its exports cheaper and more competitive. So in the buildup of World War II, most developed countries across the world increasingly resorted to these four methods and because of which the global trade was suffering because protectionism has its own fair share of disadvantages.
Of course, it offers more growth opportunity, lower imports, more jobs, and higher GDP for the local population or for the residents of the country. But in the longer term, it is not good for any economy. Why? Because first and foremost, it leads to stagnation of technological advancement. As domestic producers don't need to worry about foreign competition, they have no incentive to innovate or spend resources on R&D of new products. Similarly. There is very limited choice for consumers. If you ask your parents about the choices they had about electronics good or even cars, they would tell you that they were not available because consumers have access to fewer goods in a market as a result of limitations on how much foreign goods can be imported because of protectionist policies. There is increase in prices due to lack of competition. Consumers will need to pay more without seeing any significant improvement in the product and since there are very less number of choices consumer has to choose what is available and finally it leads to economic isolation because there are high tariffs there are quotas and there are subsidies given to local markets and local producers that country or that economy becomes to grow increasingly distant from other economies and so the exchange of ideas is minimum and which leads to not just economic but also political and cultural isolation just try to think of north korea when you talk about protectionism it's just not economically isolated but also culturally and politically and so that is why a need was felt to create an organization which would counter protectionism would liberalize trade by reducing tariffs and removing quotas among member countries this will not just counter protectionism but increase in global trade which would then boost the war ravaged economy of world war 2 scenario and so in this context gatt was thought of ultimately it was taken over by wto later on but this is the context in which wto works So so far we have understood why it is important to have a global institution working towards a global trade or a rule based trading system. So some important aspects of WTO is that it was established in 1995 or rather it took over or changed its form from GATT to WTO and it is a successor of that and it deals just not with goods which was the main emphasis of GATT but it deals with services intellectual property dispute settlement as well as trade monitoring an important aspect is that it is not a specialized agency of united nations although it has an arrangement with the united nations through which it maintains strong relation with united nations so this is a very important information and so wto functions for smooth free and predictable global trade or for the creation of free trade which is a policy that means governments do not charge people to import or bring in goods from other countries or make exporter pay taxes to send their goods abroad because you need to understand that when companies invest in other countries they want the trading rules to not change suddenly in their disadvantage and for that they need protection and so that framework is provided by wto and so it is important for us to understand and appreciate the advantages which are derived from wto So first and foremost is that it talks about a gradual reduction of tariffs as you can clearly see the example of united states on your screen on your y axis we have tariffs as a percentage of imports and on x axis you have years and if you start looking from 1940 you can clearly see a gradual reduction in the import duties imposed by united states and similar is the case with other countries as well and so it talks about gradual reduction of tariffs and through which it wants to promote free trade then it acts as a legal framework not just for negotiation of countries or among them but also for other kinds of trade barriers as well then it enables trade without any discrimination and it is not like that wto is just a body vouching for free trade or completely free trade which means no tariffs no barriers no quotas nothing it allows for tariffs and trade restrictions under certain conditions for example if a country a feels that a country b is exporting very cheap raw material which is artificially deflated 
then the country A can impose duties without violating WTO rules. Similarly, there are clauses such as national security which a country can utilize to impose significant barriers to trade for a specific country. And then finally, all these rules are to protect fair competition because there are rules because there are rules which member countries have to abide by. Whether it is about subsidies or contracts or import or export, once you become a member of WTO, your national rules have to align by the general framework. And so that is how the disadvantages of protectionism are countered. It leads to lower prices for consumers because then imports become cheaper. It promotes fair trade because then foreign companies can function in any of the countries which are member and can expect a fair treatment from the government. Then it leads to specialization because when all companies are treated equally, then the companies can produce a product anywhere across the world. And that location is mainly decided by the factor of manufacturing cost and not other policies like quotas and tariffs and other barriers. And finally, it leads to the development of economies of scale. Because by encouraging free trade, firms can specialize and produce higher quantity. This enables even more economies of scale, which is important for industries, especially in the current context. And the success of WTO is demonstrated by the raw data. WTO has over 160 members representing 98% of world trade. There has been an increase in the trade dispute which have been brought to WTO showing that WTO indeed has become a forum to help resolve these disputes. Also WTO regulations have helped avoid a major trade war. And finally let's see the data. So on your screen this graph shows world exports as a percentage of GDP. So on the y-axis you have exports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP and on x-axis you have timeline and you can clearly see an increasing trend throughout. So this clearly shows increasing global trade in last 50 years since the time a global rule based order was established in global trade. Despite all its advantages there are some issues and they are significant ones. There are a lot of areas where WTO has been severely criticized. On one hand, it is true that it has led to counter protectionism. But on the other hand, it is also true that it has given rise to inequalities, not just in terms of wealth, but also in terms of industrial and other kinds of development. Let us understand how. So first and foremost criticism of WTO is that it is unfavorable to developing nations because it is derived from GATT which was established in the context of World War II and all the victors and the global north came together to frame a rule which was very beneficial to them. For example, let's take the case of tariff protection. This is the way which was resorted to by developed countries during the time of industrial revolution. They utilize heavy import duties to stop the import of goods from foreign countries. US did it to exclude Germany, Germany did it to exclude Britain and each one of them did for each other. They utilized these tariff and quotas to grow their economy. And now once they are developed, they have access to technology, they have access to capital and now they want developing countries to significantly reduce their tariff barriers. They want India to significantly reduce and continuously lower their import duties. And so we know that countries like India and other countries do not have industrial base. And at that point of time, if the import duty is significantly reduced, it leads to the import of cheaper products from foreign countries and then which further deters the industrial growth. And the second reason why it is unfavorable to developing nations is the categorization of most favored nation by WTO. So under WTO agreement, countries cannot normally discriminate between their trading partners. So for example, they cannot grant someone a special favor such as a lower custom duty or rate. And if you do it for one, you will have to do it for others as well. So what does that mean? That means that if India is providing special treatment to a third country A, it will have to provide the same treatment to company from USA, a company from China. And that is a problem because companies from USA and China are pretty strong, right? Negotiating at WTO or 
any of its meetings require a very high level of specialized and technical knowledge of not just the law but also about nuances of trade and economy which developing countries generally do not have and since they do not have that kind of human resource which can negotiate on their behalf more often than not the agreements especially for african countries are designed against them and of course when it is unfavorable to developing countries in more aspects it is favorable to developing nations because the way negotiations have been designed or the way agreements work they enable various kinds of protection and these protections are applicable only for developed countries let's take the agreement on agriculture which is the framework which governs the farm subsidies of wto which is the agreement of wto which governs the farm subsidies it has categorized the farm subsidies into trade distorting domestic subsidies and non trade distorting subsidies so all those subsidies which are trade distorting shall have to be eliminated whereas all which are not trade distorting can go on so all trade distorting subsidies are categorized under amber box whereas non trade distorting subsidies are categorized under blue and green boxes and so under wto these are allowed an interesting fact is that most developed nations provide their farmers with the kinds of subsidies which are categorized under this box whereas the way india or the way other developing nations provide subsidies to their farmers have been categorized under trade distorting and it is a pressure on them to put an end or at least reduce these subsidies which of course is in favor of developed nations then recently There has been a push for change in definition of developing country under the principle of special and differential treatment so which talks about upgrading certain developing countries from the status of developing and this is going to deeply impact not just india but many other countries like china egypt turkey as well as south africa and The reason behind this is that there is an assumption that these countries have benefited immensely from WTO rules since its formation in 1995 and there is also a belief that these countries have progressed enough that they should not be getting benefits of a developing country and so that is also going to act in favor of developed nations then a very important and a good thing about wto is that all decisions are made on consensus there is no concept of voting and unless and until all the members agree to a particular agreement that shall not come into force that is a good thing but that itself has become the biggest roadblock in the progress of wto since the members of wto are clearly divided between developed or you can say global north versus global south there has been a lack of development on any of the major agreements in last 20 years and there is a fragmentation among countries so for example developed countries want to push their agenda with respect to rules on e-commerce investment intellectual property rights but exactly on these agenda Developing countries are quite reluctant. Similarly, developing countries want to push for reform of agreement on agriculture which developed countries are not interested because they already are having a lot of benefits from that. Then there are other issues as well. For example, agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights or acronymed as TRIPS which is an international legal agreement between all the member nations of WTO with respect to rules regarding protection of intellectual property rights for example protection of patents copyrights logos and various other such creations for companies from one country into another it establishes minimum standards for regulation by national governments of different forms of ip and it has been mainly criticized by developing countries because of its discriminatory nature because it is discriminatory in nature why is it discriminatory because most of the intellectual properties are owned by countries which belong to developed world and now they want to sell their products in developing countries but want their iprs to be protected at the same level as they are protected in developed countries and now this is leading to creation of artificial scarcity of products which can be okay in some cases but cannot be good in various fields for example in medical fields in pharmaceuticals let's take an example of a medicine let's say if india has weak ipr laws and if a company somehow manages to develop the same medicine which is being sold in america and it starts to manufacturing that is not possible right now but at least it is going to save a lot of lives but with imposition of strict 
strips laws only company a which originally manufactured that medicine is allowed to sell products in the developing countries as well then the next issue arises from dispute resolution mechanism of wto dispute settlement system or dss is a mechanism to resolve trade dispute between and among member states the members of dss are also appointed by consensus and so if one of the member blocks the appointment it shall become dysfunctional and it has become dysfunctional since 2019 because of lot of trouble being created by united states which has led to very low number of judges to produce rulings there are just not enough judges to produce rulings and it has led to a huge backlog of cases pending in dss and finally when the countries grow very powerful they start resorting to unilateral tariffs if you are reading newspaper you must have read that in past 2 to 3 years how china and usa have unilaterally imposed various kinds of tariffs on each other products without paying heed to the rules and procedures of wto similarly in the wake of covid-19 pandemic many countries including india have resorted to protectionism despite wto in existence so clearly you can understand that challenges is in front of wto are not small there are mega challenges which the new director general would have to face so in this regard in this discussion we started by first understanding the context in which the parent body or the predecessor of wto was formed that is gatt that context was extreme protectionism to counter which a gatt was established which then passed on the baton to wto then we understood what advantages have been arrived how it has worked in favor of increasing the global trade but nonetheless it has its fair share of challenges and issues which needs to be resolved pretty soon let us now move on to the next discussion In today's newspaper we have many articles on green hydrogen we have an editorial article a green promise we also have another article in the FAQ section India's plan to develop green hydrogen hydrogen and ammonia these are expected to replace the fossil fuels in the future and very much in the near future one of the primary criteria for a nation's ecologically sustainable energy security is the production of the fuels using renewable energy hydrogen is one of the energy dense fuel it's much more dense than diesel and petrol so we are targeting hydrogen as a fuel but it has to be a renewable source of energy hydrogen you understand in the form it is usable as fuel in the form of h2 is not found in nature although it is the most abundant element in universe and to get this form energy is required if we source the energy from renewable sources and produce hydrogen or ammonia we get green hydrogen green ammonia so essentially it's not just hydrogen as a fuel it is green hydrogen or green ammonia that is going to ensure ecologically sensitive sustainable energy security although you must know it already but let's do a quick recap Hydrogen as a fuel can be classified into various categories and those categories are named with color based upon how it is produced. Black hydrogen are those hydrogen which are produced using fossil fuel. If the hydrogen is produced by the mean of electrolysis, meaning passing electricity through water and breaking it down, electrolysis of water. But the electricity is sourced from nuclear power plant. Then the hydrogen is called as pink hydrogen. Brown hydrogen are those produced using coal. effectively electricity being produced by coal gray hydrogen is the one produced using natural gas and the emission is released into the air if hydrogen is produced using natural gas and the emissions are captured then it is called as blue hydrogen green hydrogen would be effectively zero carbon fuel so you will not be using coal no natural gas no burning but still you need electricity for electrolysis and that electricity will be produced using renewable sources like wind and solar energy but presently green hydrogen is less than 1% of total hydrogen produced it's important to focus on green hydrogen because as per various reports for instance as per the international renewable energy agency hydrogen will make up 12% of energy mix by 2050 that is an imperative if we are moving towards meeting the paris climate agreement targets and as per the world energy transition outlook report produced by international renewable energy agency 66% of the hydrogen produced 
must be green hydrogen if we are to remain on 1.5 degrees Celsius above the industrial level pathway. Hydrogen as a fuel is important because we are going to run short of fossil fuel. Hydrogen fuel has many merits that we will talk about shortly. But what we should be targeting for is green hydrogen instead to not only serve the purpose of uninterrupted supply of energy rich fuels but also to meet the climate change targets. Green hydrogen is going to be very very significant in the coming times A because it has high energy density. The energy density is almost three times that of diesel. The energy demand in the coming time is only going to rise. However, the supply of fossil fuel is going to decline. India presently is world's fourth largest energy consumer. And according to IEA's forecast, India will overtake European Union to become the world's third largest consumer by 2030. The largest consumer presently is China followed by United States. European Union is at third position, India at fourth. But soon we are going to come at third taking over European Union. So in this context, the supply of energy demand is going to be fulfilled by new sources and green hydrogen is the prime mover in that direction. Green hydrogen would be very significant in, in driving India's transition to clean energy in meeting climate change targets. We have pledged to reduce our emission intensity very significantly in, in the Paris Agreement targets. We do not have enough fossil fuel sources, but we can produce green hydrogen if we get enough technology and develop ecosystem for development of green hydrogen. And that will reduce the import dependency. And whenever a new technology comes in, it brings along with itself the entire ecosystem of development of other technologies as well. The pressure pumps, the coolant systems all have to be developed indigenously. If you come to think of more significance, it can also help in developing more trade relations with other countries. Germany and Japan, for instance, they are leading in this source of fuel. And if we start producing, their demand is very high. We can become a prominent supplier of green hydrogen to these nations. Government has announced green hydrogen, green ammonia policy. We'll see what this policy talks about. But in general, what a policy should do. Policy for anything must do essentially three things. It should help bring more investments. It must ease the operational process and it should enable creation of demand. These three elements will be true for any kind of policy. If the government is going to come up for a policy for 5G, it must ensure that investment comes in development of 5G equipments and, and rolling out 5G services for customers. It should ensure that the infrastructure that we had for 4G is better utilized for 5G as well and whatever beefing up of infrastructure is required is done and compatibility of devices and repeaters and routers and other things in transmission line, those things are streamlined. If more towers have to be set for 5G, then the land can be easily procured. The operational process has to be made easy. That's one of the prime purpose of any policy. Government also has to ensure that it looks for use cases of 5G. Many of you might not require 5G. Many of you, many of you must already be happy with the 4G services. Why do you require such a fast speed? In e-health, in e-education, for other financial services, government will have to look for use cases of that technology. It has to create demand. So basically, if these three things are insured, you have easy operational process, investment would come in. And, and if you have all three placed together, then the policy would be a success. Now to ensure these three things, what has the policy on green hydrogen and green ammonia done? The first thing that a policy does is to provide financial incentive for the production of semiconductor chips. Government of India has given the incentive of, of rupees 10 crore for any company that sets up a manufacturing plant for chips in India. Semiconductor chips. In this case, Government of India has given an incentive of 25 years of free power transmission for any renewable energy facilities built to produce power for green hydrogen generation before July 2025. This means a green hydrogen producer in Rajasthan may build a solar power plant to send renewable energy to a green hydrogen plant in Assam without having to pay any interstate transmission fees. And this move is likely going to make it more economical for key users of hydrogen and ammonia such as oil refining companies, fertilizer producing companies, steel sector. They can produce their own green hydrogen. These sectors currently use grey hydrogen or grey ammonia produced using natural gas. The government plans to create a single gateway for all green hydrogen production clearances. 
government also plans to create a mechanism for producers to bank any excess renewable energy created with discounts up to 30 days this requirement of time bound clearance for these projects it's definitely going to help in spurring investment single gateway for clearances these mechanism of banking excess energy with discounts there is also a provision of grid connectivity on priority for energy developed using green hydrogen all these are going to ease the operational process then government must also do something to create the demand and for that the power distribution companies they may procure renewable energy to supply green hydrogen producers and such procurement would also count towards renewable purchase obligation you know that the discoms have to purchase particular percentage of their total energy from renewable sources so what discoms can do they can purchase the renewable energy from the renewable source and supply it to green hydrogen producing plants and that purchase will be counted under rpo what further the government will have to do down the line is to use the hydrogen produced somewhere so maybe in hcng vehicles or hydrogen based buses that piece is a missing link in the policy what are you going to do with green hydrogen but as i have told you earlier presently green hydrogen is a microscopic minority of the total hydrogen produced so such kind of use cases can be envisaged however it cannot be enforced presently the prime obstacle in production of green hydrogen so far is the cost the, the production cost of green hydrogen has been substantially high it is also the technology that has been the limiting factor and procurement of technology itself is a cost factor the electrolyzers which are used for the process of electrolysis in the production of hydrogen from water we do not have the manufacturing base for them for use of hydrogen in the form of fuel cells in buses and vehicles hydrogen must be cost competitive and presently it is the cost that is a prohibitive factor in popularizing hydrogen as fuel but over the time the wheels will turn and the balance will tilt in the favor of green hydrogen as we have limited sources of fossil fuels and in the coming time the environmental imperatives are going to become more pressing issues and the sign for that is already there even oil producing nations like saudi arabia is prioritizing plans to manufacture this source of energy they are using the concept of idle land bank they are using the land bank for solar and wind energy generation saudi arabia is working to establish a mega 5 billion dollar green hydrogen manufacturing unit it is as large as size of belgium the world presently is experimenting the rise of hydrogen energy in all sectors in energy production in storage distribution electricity heat cooling even in households transportation any good fuel must have two characteristics energy density and sustainability green hydrogen has both the characteristics that's why green hydrogen is poised to become the energy of choice of 21st century the next article for discussion has appeared on page number 8 stabilizing ties with nepal in uncertain times So the electoral verdict in Nepal's recent election was credible. It reflected a clear emergence of voter preference for more responsive governance and impatience with traditional political power gains that ignore the aspirations of the youth and disadvantaged. Now in this context this article has analyzed India Nepal relation what are the issues what are the convergences which we have already covered. So we are going to listen to the same recording today again. so you can clearly see that within the summary of this article the fact that the india nepal relation has gone from ups and downs in recent past 5 to 10 years demonstrates that the strong cultural and geographical ties which india shares with that of nepal are not sufficient to ensure healthy relation among these two neighbors if you look at gs paper 2 you have a line in the syllabus under international relation which says india and its neighborhood relations and so out of all the eight territorial neighbors that india has nepal is one of them of course sharing 1700 kilometers of territorial border we'll first understand india and nepal's convergences the issues on which they have a coherence but at the same time it is also important for us to understand the challenges which these nations are facing and what could be some of the way forward so let us now begin the discussion Whenever we have to analyze bilateral relation between any two countries we first have to consider the convergences or the areas where their interests converge 
or they are in sync with each other now since india and nepal are neighbors and they share 1770 km long border which includes the himalayan territories as well as indo gangetic plain and here the convergence starts all the left bank tributaries of ganga which cross cut uttar pradesh and bihar have their origins in nepal and that provides the first basis of convergence so you would have mahakali river then you have bheri river rapti river then you have gandak and then of course you have koshi and finally arun river so these are the major ri rivers which bring a lot of discharge into the ganga plains and so the common management of water resources has translated into the form of koshi treaty mahakali treaty which have provided an area of cooperation relating to the management of water resources and the flood management so you can see that water and disaster have provided a common ground for india and nepal to interact with each other apart from it most of these rivers have the common joint projects with respect to the hydro power india cannot let go this hydro power this immense potential energy which the water holds in the higher himalayas but the problem is that nepal does not have the technology india has the technology but india do not have access to these potential water energy resources and so it's a win win situation for both of them india provides nepal with the technology infrastructure capital and builds the dams through which then electricity which is generated is shared between india and nepal and so it's a great convergence and so you have power exchange agreement for meeting the power requirements in border areas then both these countries have signed cross border oil product pipeline from motihari in bihar to amlekganj in nepal and of course multiple hydroelectric projects uh, for example in sulu corridor next area of convergence is the connectivity projects for example raksol kathmandu railway project and bbin another major area of convergence is the cultural and educational links which exist between india and nepal so india provides scholarships to nepalese students for various courses almost all the premier institutes have some kind of student exchange program where the nepalese the bangladeshi sri lankan maldivian student come and study the courses at almost free of cost this also includes the premier training institutes of indian administrative service indian police service indian revenue service as far as the cultural links are concerned you can understand that the close geographical proximity and drawing of the line during the british era meant that the cultural exchange had been free from millennial and so the strong historical and cultural links in terms of uh, religion language and cuisine has culminated into what is famously known as roti beti ka nata which basically means that people from across the international border are connected with each other in terms of roti which means livelihood and beti which means exchange of the daughters so there are marriages happening across the border and people are migrating to and fro from india largely from nepal to india in search of livelihood so the relationship between india and nepal is quite multi dimensional it extends from culture to economy to infrastructure project but it also has a very important strategic angle to it which makes it extremely crucial for india to maintain good ties with nepal so for example you should see the location of nepal it acts as a natural security buffer between china and india since india and nepal have traditionally shared quite good relationship the border is largely porous now this largely porous border has ensured free flow of goods and services and also the people and so it has also caused a lot of internal security issues within the country so for example the harmonious relations between the two countries has allowed the insurgents from across the border to cross the border and take shelter in the other country and so a good relation between india and nepal is important to counter the internal security threat of both the nations and hence India assists the Nepal army in its modernization and military exercises like Surya Kiran to boost interoperability. And for this very purpose the political stability of Nepal is extremely important because if the one of the reasons for example the Madhesi region of the Nepal is unstable it will lead to the spill over into India just like when Bangladesh became unstable we had a lot of illegal migrants into the country. 
But in past 10 years, we have seen a significant number of challenges when it has come to India-Nepal issues. And one which India is facing with all its neighbors is China's rising influence in South Asia, which is reflected or manifested in a lot of forms. For example, Nepal was very ecstatic and immediately joined the Belt and Road Initiative, which is not something a friendly country to India would do. Eventually, it could join, but the kind of activity and the kind of enthusiasm which the Nepal has shown when it comes to increasingly close relation with China is something which is irritating India. Apart from that, the Nepal's internal politics is increasingly demonstrating anti-India rhetoric. And it seems like the political parties are trying to gain mileage by criticizing India during the election time, which then shows that the people in Nepal are not happy with India which is obviously reflected in a lot of radical steps which Nepal has taken. For example, the Kalapani dispute with respect to the origin of the river Kali and subsequent amendment of the Nepal's map by the parliament to include the territories held by India is something which is not expected from a friendly country. It's something which can be expected from Pakistan and China, but not from Nepal. But apart from that, some of the concerns shown by Nepal are quite genuine. For example, the Nepal's discontent with India arises from the fact that when it comes to bilateral trade between India and Nepal, Nepal has a huge trade deficit that it incurs in bilateral trade relation with India and that has been a cause of concern for Nepal, which Nepal thinks that India is not addressing sufficiently. Apart from that, the distrust towards India is a result of India's big brotherly attitude because India has signed India-Nepal friendship treaty with Nepal. And this treaty has become one of the basis points for anti-India rhetoric in the politics of Nepal. India is not ready to reconsider the treaty which does not provide dignity or equality to Nepal as the Nepalese think it to be. Apart from that, India's inability to carry out the projects in timely fashion has been a cause of concern with all its neighbors. Because India is a soft state, it does not have the capability which China has to get the projects done in a timely and promised fashion. And that has led or contributed to Nepal's discontent. And finally, unrestricted cross-border movement has particularly impacted Nepal's domestic industry, local livelihood opportunities, law and order and national security, especially during the times of COVID. And so it's time for India to focus on multimodal connectivity projects to further integrate India and Nepal in a relationship with respects equality of both the nations. And hence, it is also time for India to revisit the India-Nepal Friendship Treaty. At the same time, India and Nepal have to focus upon setting up appropriate bilateral mechanisms to discuss contentious issues. For example, for example, to set up a joint mechanism for boundary disputes and for proper project implementation. Apart from that, if you look at it, India and Nepal share a lot of multilateral forums. For example, BBIN, BIMSTEC, NAM, SARC. And hence, these platforms must be utilized to serve common interests. And apart from that, finally, we need sustained engagement and limited interference with Nepal's internal affairs and political spectrum for the people of Nepal to feel empowered and equal with India. So the last news for today, Asian elephant has lost most of its optimal habitat in Nilgiri Reserve has appeared in the Hindu newspaper. So a paper, Fencing Can Alter Gene Flow of Asian Elephant Population Within Protected Areas was published in the International Peer-Reviewed Open Access General Conservation by a multidisciplinary team of ecologists, conservationists and scientists. In it, they say that the Western Ghat is an escarpment running north-south along the western coastline of India, which you already know just by the basics of geography which is interrupted towards the south by the low-lying Palghat gap that separates the northern from the southern elephant population. This gap has been transformed by agriculture for several centuries, is 3 km at its narrowest and 40 km at its widest. The northern part of Western Ghat includes Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve and its surrounding protected areas, which contain the largest remaining population of wild animals. 
the palghat gap is a break in the ghats and that is relatively flat and consequently easily negotiable by elephants however human settlements and crop cultivation have hindered the movement of the elephants keeping them confined to the hilly areas considered suboptimal habitats and so in this regard from the perspective of environment prelims it is important for us to understand few of the basic stuff about asian elephants their iucn status is endangered and they inhabit grasslands tropical evergreen forests semi evergreen forests moist deciduous forest dry deciduous forest and dry thorn forest in addition to cultivated and secondary forests or scrublands elephants can range over large areas and as a consequence elephants disperse seeds over longer distance than most of their herbivores elephant disperse seeds over longer distances than most other herbivores and thus are responsible for structuring and maintaining plant diversity within ecosystems given their large area requirements elephants are regarded as umbrella species because their conservation will also protect a large number of species large number of other species occupying the same area they may also be considered as flagship species because of their iconic or cultural value and keystone species because of their important ecological role and impact on environment asian elephant society is organized into well defined matrilineal communities or clans comprising adult females as well as sub adult and juvenile males and females a recent study from the resource rich well protected ecosystem of kaziranga in northeast india suggests that female led herds move about their activity centers considerably more than adult males their range and as far as their range and distribution is concerned they are present in more than 50% of the country